Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian-American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. Commemorative history months are bestowed upon groups still marginalized in our society. Though they comprise more than half of humanity, women are among these groups, still not considered or treated fully equal across the globe. March is Women's History Month, and in this one-hour special, Italics talks to five Italian-American women who are making their mark. Luis Hermelino is the Reviews Director of Publishers Weekly and author of the novels Joey D. Gets Wise, The Black Madonna, and The Sisters Malone, as well as the forthcoming Mala Femina. She joins us at the Calandra Institute. Louisa, welcome to Italics. Thank you. It's nice to be here. You were born and raised in the village. Yes. Which was at that time a little working class neighborhood. Yes. Now it's Soho. Yes. And you still live there. I still live there on the same street yeah. I was born. So what was it like growing up in uh, Little Italy? It was Italy? fabulous. It was like a small village. And it was only a few blocks where yeah. everything happened. Three undertakers on one street, four grocery stores, four butchers, and everyone was very specific where they went. Everyone knew everyone else. It went back two, three generations. Every apartment had three generations in it. It was really embracing and comfortable, and it was lovely. There was a kind of security and a sense of belonging that was, I don't know, it's yeah. really hard to find today. Mm. And then you left. I left for all the reasons that I loved. It was embracing, uh, yeah. everyone knew your business. <laughs> and I left for a long time, I went off to school. I was the second young woman to go away to college. From the was neighborhood. Which kind of a scandal, yeah. My mother yeah. had to put up with a lot. But I always say I was raised with benign neglect because I was the second child after 11 years. Mm. And my brother was already you know, married and living across the street and having children and sort of, he was the focus. So I kind of snuck out while nobody was looking. Mm. And then um, when I came back after many years, uh, there was still the neighborhood, but there was also the artists were starting to move mm. in. So it was the best of both worlds. It mm. was incredible. You raised your kids in Little Italy? No, or I came they back were, alone, yeah, and yeah. then I, yeah, I married someone yes. from a block away, uh -huh. which was shocking. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, I raised yeah. my family there. And yeah. sort of, they were sort of, my children, I think, were the last generation to get that sense of extended family and neighborhood. On the one hand, your story seems to be um, an anomaly. That is that the, the Italian leaves the, na the old neighborhood, whatever, and then eventually circles back around and really sort of underscores that sense of Italianness or Italianita, if you will, in Italian, that seems to um, have uh, sunken in and not left us. It's sort of, you know. Well, the thing about those communities is there's all kinds of people in them. You know, it's not sanitized, mm -hmm. and it's so real. One might say that a lot of this experience from when you were a kid, when you came back as an adult, et cetera, is part and parcel of your writing. Um, four books to date, um, three already published, one forthcoming this coming summer. August, yes, um, from Saraband. Right, the Italian American culture in New York City is there. The power of women, Italian American women, is there. In all of its sense, the power <laughs> of women. Some people have said you talk about women living dangerously, and then also women breaking ancient taboos. Well, I think in the first three books, the, the women are definitely powerful, but it's, it's subtle, it's behind the scenes. You know, they, they know how to play the game. But in the new book, um, there's some, it's a collection, so there's stories from before, but there's women breaking the rules. In, it, it moves into yeah. the, the 60s and the mm -hmm. 70s, mm -hmm. and it's, it's different. Because the other books are at least Sisters Malone and, um, uh, what is it, Black, The Black Madonna. Those are set in the 20s and 30s, correct? 40s, yeah. 50s, yeah. yeah. It's confined. It's yeah. a very confined um, milieu. But in the new collection, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. 
It's mm -hmm. Afghanistan, it's India, it's Southern Italy, it's, you know, it's... it's and the title is Mala Femmina. Mala Femmina. Now, where does that title come from? I mean, people, of course, most of our audience will know Mala Femmina is the famous Italian folk song, whatever. Well, it's a song that my mother always sang, so I'm, I'm very attached to it. But I've been fascinated with the idea of a woman who gets what she wants and does what she wants and really kind of doesn't worry about anyone else. And the, there's a story in the collection, Mala Femina, about mm -hmm. a woman like that who comes from Italy. And she's just impervious. You know, nothing, nothing shakes mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. And I hope that maybe she'll show up again in a novel. I'm thinking about her. But she's been haunting me for a long time, and she comes out of the Rione in Naples. Mm. You know, she's the illegitimate child of uh, a mafioso uh -huh. and his young woman, who, of course, so Great. I just got this idea there. Of course, she's beautiful. And she has that walk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you try to manipulate them in a way that they're not just flat stereotypes? Well, I, I try and think of them as real people. You know, there's a lot of Italian Americans there. There's the wonderful Nona, mm -hmm. you know, the grandmother right. who cooks, yeah. and the father who comes home and he's very strict and blah, blah, blah. And that's, that's not really real because everyone has many facets. And I think my work doesn't have those stereotypes. That's why the women are always breaking out. And um, they're bonding. They're very close. So while the, you know, the male character in, in Italian-American stereotypical stories is always so strong, but, you know, they're not the most interesting. Mm. It's, it's, I find the women are the ones who are interesting. You published your first book in 1991, right? Joey D. Gets Wise. That's terrifying. Huh? <laughs> Anthony. <laughs> well, we have to talk about dates for you to give a little bit of a tra trajectory here, right? And then, you, 10 years later, your second novel came out, The Black Madonna in 2001. From The Black Madonna, The Sisters Malone, which has the a wonderful subtitle, Una Storia di Familia. That came out immediately after, a year. Were you working on those together? Well, the story is I wrote The Black Madonna and I couldn't publish it. Uh, and they said, do you want to keep working on it? And I said, absolutely not. I'm going to start something else. So then when I sold The Sisters Malone, they said, do you have anything else? You know, they're always <laughs> looking for something in the yeah. background. And I said, I do, I do. Yeah. So that's okay. kind of how it happened. Yeah. They were both written. All four of your books are with great presses. We're not talking about. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You've been able to publish and we hear that um, Italian American writers are told that if their work doesn't include the stereotypes, they can't get published, and instead you've been able to publish. What do we say to that? Well, know? first of all, I think the stars have to cross to yeah. get published at all. You know, it, it's really serendipitous. I think you need an editor who sees something in the work mm -hmm. and sees something that tells a story but also has the characters have to be rich, which is the opposite of stereotypes. Mm. It's hard to avoid stereotypes. Mm. And you have to, to some degree, admit that they're there, you know, and they appeal to people because you can understand them. You know, they're, they're used to it. But when you step outside the box, then you get something great, like, you know, very internally. You know what these characters are thinking and feeling. So mm. even if on the outside, they're stereotypical, you see them as people. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key. I think characters Working are the key. Working hard to make them real people, quote yeah. unquote, real people. I want to read something. There is lyricism in the language of Ms. Ermelino's splendid collection that lulls us. Line after seductive line, from the mundane to the menacing. Mala Femina is the work of a bold and original writer. And this comes 15 years after your first book. So this is Gay Talese. Yes, the wonderful Gay Talese. <laughs> You're the director of, for reviews at Publishers Weekly, yes. which is, of course, you know, if your book, regardless of what the review is, if it gets reviewed in Publishers Weekly, you've made it, right? So, and, and, and that just alone has to be overwhelming, the number of books that come across, that come to Publishers Weekly. We get a, a, around a thousand books a week. It makes you very sensitive to what's good and what's not, because you don't have patience. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're looking at reviewing a hundred books a week. I don't personally review them, but like you said, a couple of pages and you see what the writing's like, you see where it's going, and you don't have time to give it a lot of attention. Mm. 
how does that affect you as a writer? Well, sometimes it makes me feel like, oh my goodness, you know, do I, does anybody really need to hear me? You know, there's so many people out there. So that's daunting, but it also puts things in perspective. Yeah. You know, and you do the work because you want to do the work and you wish it the best and you do the best you can, but you realize that it's a big, big playing field. And you're, it's, kind of, it's kind of amazing to see the books that do make it because there's no formula. So there's that magical part of it that you see that's kind of wonderful. Yeah. That's what the and, arts are. And I may be wrong, correct me, but it seems that there may be more spotlight on some of the nonfiction, some of the essays we've seen from a lot of ethnics uh, today as opposed to um, the more crea you know, cre creative narrative novels, stories, whatever. Well, it's easier to sell a nonfiction book. Oh, you know, you've got a platform. Fiction uh, is, you know, oh, secrets will be revealed and so-and-so yeah. -so goes back to... But I always feel like with fiction, you create a world. I mean, the first people that dictators get rid of is the writers. <laughs> so um, I think it's really important to understand people, to understand cultures, and that's how we learn about each other. I think fiction is, is more important yeah. for that. Let's talk specifics about some of your works. All right. Joey D gets wise. The main character is Joey D. He's a young man. And the inspiration was actually a neighborhood story that I always heard my mother tell. And it involved a woman who left her working husband and went off with the neighborhood mafioso. And she was kind of a pariah, but she was also in control. She was very powerful. She lived in a beautiful apartment. Her daughter was adopted by the second husband. And she always fascinated me. Like, how did she do that? She had this affair. Everyone knows your business. You know, she was with a dangerous man. And actually, in the real story, um, she turned him in to the police and she testified against him, and it was unheard of that he refused to have anyone harm her in any way. So she was, again, here's my bad woman, she was a fascinating character. And everyone kind of whispered about her. So that's where that came from. There's this young boy who gets involved with her, of course, because she's kind of magical. And she's in the background, to some degree, in the story. Yes. Whereas the women come into the forefront in your later work. Yes, in the second one, in The Black right. Madonna, you have a woman again whose husband is a merchant marine and he's all over the place. And she finds out that he has another family. And of course, he's the love of her life and she's been, you know, so faithful to him. And when she finds this out, she kind of takes the power. And she has a son and she manages to make a life for herself without him and deal with the gossip and everything else. And then the Sisters Malone, of course, goes one step further when you have three sisters who are Italian, but they're raised in Hell's Kitchen with the Irish. And one of them marries an Italian man from the neighborhood. And the other two are just wild women. They have a series of husbands, they drink in bars, they have jobs, and they come together to protect their third sister. So the women get more and more powerful and, and more and more in the forefront. And then in Mala Femina, of course, they just do whatever they want. <laughs> they, they travel, they take Reasons lovers. Reasons for which they're mala yeah. femina. Yeah. But in a good sense, they mala femina. children, yes. 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 Yeah. Because, you know, women are, are painted as they're loving, they're gentle, they're sweet, they're faithful. You know, they're just people. You know, there's women that don't love their children. You know, there's women that aren't faithful. There's women that, you know, have strong sexual feelings. And I think that's what I'm trying to portray in the book. It doesn't really make them bad. It makes them bad in the way society looks at them as stereotypical. In the book, like the opening story starts out somewhere in the, in the 30s, and women didn't have a lot of options at that period. They couldn't just go out and get a job. They couldn't just leave their husband. They'd be ostracized from society. Their children would be marked. They'd have no money. You know, they had no recourse. They didn't, even if they had an abusive husband, they had no recourse even with the police because it was considered domestic. It had nothing to do with anything. In the opening story, there's a woman who decides that even though she's not in a very good position, her daughter is going to be different. And the key in it is that she tells the midwife 
to bury the afterbirth because yeah. she wants the child to be able to go out in the world. And that symbolizes that. And then it, it continues into women in the modern world who um, kind of break the rules. You know, they don't get married young. They don't have children. They do what they want. Um, even though, even in modern society, it's difficult for women. They're still expected to behave a certain way. I mean, this is an ongoing conversation, you know. Can you have it all? Well, you know what? No, you can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and maybe yeah. that's why people yeah. think you're bad, because yeah. you have to make these hard choices. The future of Italian-American writing, uh, what you see, um, what, what you hope for, I hope that more women write, and I hope that um, the community is able to move out of the stereotypes and into what's going on now, because it's a long time. I mean, you have pockets of places where it seems to still exist, but you know what? It's minimal. And I, I hope Italian Americans, they have done, but I hope in their writing they move more into life as it is, yeah. you know, because they do have a special perspective, but it's not necessarily the stereotypical perspective. And, and I hope they um, get more involved with Italian culture because it's magnificent. And we're looking forward to Mala Femmina, Luis Ermelino. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Anthony. <laughs> In our next segment, Lucia Grillo talks with four women of the theater, Donna De Matteo, Karen Malpied, Ava Minimar, and Nicole Pandolfo. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. What attracted you to the theater? S strangely, my grandmother was an actress. She wanted to be an actress, and she did act, and she came to New York and studied, and this is in the 20s. And my mother also wanted to be an actress, and she had a radio show <laughs> called oh. Something for the Girls <laughs> in the 50s. Uh, but because of that, and my mother acted in little theater and, you know, uh, in summer stock and, and things like that. Because of that, I never wanted anything to do with the theater. And my father was very opposed to the theater. Uh, did, but uh, by the time I really got interested in the theater, it was through literature, through reading plays, actually, and falling in love with uh, dramatic literature. So I grew up in South Jersey, and um, my first uh, theatrical experience that I can remember was my mom uh, bringing me into the city to see the Rockettes, their Christmas show, which was wonderful. And then from there, uh, we came in to see off-Broadway stuff and shows on Broadway. I really remember there was this show based, I think, on Janis Joplin's Diaries, and it was the first thing I had seen um, in a smaller theater than Broadway. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just, that, I just kind of remember, like, breaking my world open as to, like, what the experience of theater could be. I think I've always been theatrical, even in the womb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so even like maybe at seven, I remember going with the kids on the block to their church. We were, I was raised Catholic, um, but they were Protestant, but they were doing a musical. So I was Protestant that summer. Every, <laughs> you know, every weekend I was with them just to be in their play. And, and I always wanted to go into it, you know, whether it was directing or acting. Mm -hmm. My mother was pretty much against it. You know, she gave sound advice that it wasn't for children. So I, I always pursued it, but I had to wait till much later in life uh -huh. because of, you know, my mother wasn't a stage mother until I turned maybe 20, and then she got into it. <laughs> but always the love for theater. I guess being brought up uh, where I was being brought up, where everything was a secret. Uh, where my mother would say to me, you know, I would see all the women coming and going at my grandmother's, you know and staying, and my mother was, yeah, they're having a baby, they're having a baby, they're having, and not know, you know, why they were there for that amount of time, and uh, have your mouth, you know, don't ever say you saw her here, and I thought they were just guests, or maybe going to have a baby, mm -hmm. but maybe they were, but they weren't anymore, <laughs> not once they were there, and, uh, so it was like everything was under the wire. Uh -huh. And I guess that's what does attract writers after all. 
You mentioned secrets. Was it like a quest to find truth that led you to playwriting? Well, sometimes, it, well, probably as an adult, yes. But as a child, it was really you made yourself up. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that's what makes a writer back then. <laughs> you made up your background. You made up your persona. You know, kids all came to school, and you smiled, and you did no matter what was happening in your home. Uh -huh. Do you have particular influence influences? Yeah, my work is at different points influenced by different people, but certainly uh, in terms of literature, the Greeks, the ancient Greek playwrights, and you know all classical literature, uh, uh, theater. So Ibsen, Chekhov, Brecht, Beckett, uh, Pinter, you know uh, Yeats, and the Irish dramatists had a huge influence on me because. They used theater to create a culture, to create a revolution, to free Ireland from England's boot, and that was a very inspiring story. And also, uh, Augusta Gregory was the first female playwright I ever encountered, and she was the co-founder of the Abbey Theater. She co-wrote many of Yeats's plays. She wrote 50 plays of her own. She didn't start writing plays until she was 50 years old, and then she wrote 50 plays. And she was a major, without Augusta Gregory, it would be impossible to think of the Abbey Theatre or the Irish Literary Revival. She was so crucial. So th that was very important because when I went to school there were no women playwrights in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. There were no women playwrights in the classroom <laughs> or women, women in the classroom only, except as students. Anna Magnani, for one, um, mostly because of truth. Mm -hmm. She was a pioneer for women in theatre, in film, for for Italian-American women. She was the first one to win an Oscar, the first foreigner to ever win an Oscar. I mean, and the way she handled Marlon Brando. There, you know, there was never a moment where she wasn't true. Mm -hmm. So for me, she's always been somebody that I've looked up to, that I, I was so happy to be able to tackle her life, even, you know, for a brief amount of time, especially with somebody like Lydia Vitale, mm -hmm. because she's an actress who is, you know, she's willing to try anything. If I told her, like, I'm going to hang you upside down and I want, you know, we're going to bring a leopard in here. And she, Great, where do you want me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it's wonderful when you, when you get an actress like that to work on material of that caliber. So I, I would say Magnani for me. So artistic influences, Cher. <laughs> I love Cher. There's just, I, I mean, I don't know her personally, but there's just something about the idea of who she is, which may or not may or may not be at all who she actually is, but that means something to me. Elvis, same thing. People who have influenced me in real life, Eva, oh. um, Lyle Kessler. That's wonderful. Tita Howe, she was my advisor at Hunter College, and she's just the most amazing human being. John Patrick Shanley's work really moves me, and he, he seems like to be a lovely guy from what I can tell. So that's just to name a few. There's the list I'm sure could go on and mm. on and on. Well, you know, Herbert was my mentor and my teacher, and, you know, he was so lovely. And he, you know, didn't stop you from writing anything. And, you know, he also taught you the structure of, you know, even though you can write a play and put it all over the place, it's still, you're going to have actors in it that are used to a technique and the structure. Mm -hmm. And so even though you have speeches that are uh, you know, going on and on, he was the man who really, in a wonderful way, not in a dominant way, uh -huh. he was like a father, truthfully like a, like a father uh -huh. that cared about the same thing you cared about or taught you what you really wanted to know. And I remember I studied with one man before him who was also lovely, Dick Longchamp. Mm. And uh, he too was terrific and I was maybe in that class for, you know, a workshop for, uh, I don't know, maybe a year. And he said, okay, you're ready to go to Herbert. Mm. And even though Herbert could be more, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And then he would turn around and go, but it's wonderful. <laughs> and, you know, Uta was married to Herbert, and she would come in and even read something that he loved of, you know, a new playwright. So it was like, oh, you know, really uh, couldn't complain. 
you have kind of a, a, a non-typical Italian American Jewish upbringing. Tell us a little bit about <laughs> about that world that you grew up in. Well, I grew up in Protestant suburbs with an Italian father and a Jewish mother. Both of them sort of had left there because when they married, this was a big deal to marry cross religion and also cross class because my mother's family considered themselves upper middle class and my father's family was very we were very simple people and then when he died the Italian family didn't want to see us anymore because we were not baptized and they were very 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 religious so I lost touch with all of my Italian relatives it was a big family uh, when I was 18 and I've never seen them again and it wasn't till much later that I actually fell in love with Italy, of course, and fell in love with Italians. And, and when Helen Berolini asked me to be in her book, I said, sure, if you want to know what it was like growing up in an anti-Semitic Italian family, I'll write something. And she said, absolutely. So when we used to go around doing readings for that book, mainly for Italian audiences, cultured, very cultured American Italian audiences, they would all say, Italians don't throw children out of the family. <laughs> <laughs> this is not done. <laughs> you know? wow. um, and, you know, it was done. But, but um, so my sort of love affair with Italy and, and, and uh, I mean, the food was always there, but, but the culture came later uh, for me when I actually got to go to Italy. How has being an Italian-American woman influenced your work, if at all? I think I'm always trying to uphold both sides of my culture. My father was born in Tel Aviv, and my mother oh. is Italian-Sicilian. So there's lots of guilt and shame <laughs> in my family, and there's lots of overeating on both sides. So I'm always attracted to, to both cultures and, and working on material for both cultures. And I was in L.A. for about 10 years, and the Los Angeles community doesn't doesn't really uphold the Italian American culture like mm -hmm. I wish they would. So I created a festival that your work was in, mm -hmm. uh, La Lupa Italian Cultural Arts Festival, which was to bring Italian culture to the Los Angeles community and to the children. So I think the idea of, you know, upholding our roots and, and where did mm -hmm. where did it originally start? Like things like mask work mm -hmm. that the Italians created, mm -hmm. and you know, it. I think it needs to be. It needs, it's not just Pirandello. Mm -hmm. It needs to be brought into the future, is what mm -hmm. I mean. You know, there's lots of like Italian classics that are done over and over mm -hmm. again. Whereas, you know, even working in Rome and talking to people in Rome, that they felt like they're half trapped in the antiquities. That, you know, yeah. here is the Colosseo. Right. And, you know, but what about Italian culture now? Mm -hmm. And, and what, what is really relevant right now? And what are they, what are they putting forward that's new? Mm -hmm. And are they still representing the old? So I think that's important. I think, I wish, I wish there was more. And I wish I was doing more for it. Yeah. So I think it's important as Italian women that there's new role models and that we're still upholding the past. But there's, there's got to be a balance. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, it would be great if there would be something cohesive with that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I think like, so pr probably the TV show The Sopranos um, was the first time maybe that I felt like I was watching some obvious, in many ways, not like my life, but in some ways, <laughs> like my experience. Um, it, there was just something about that TV show that I, I felt I connected to something. I connected to like the way this family um, deals with each other and the importance of like good eating a nice meal as like an important sort of like foundation for like all other life. You have a lot of let's say non-conventional topics in your plays even um, talk about our son's wedding. Oh yeah you know the company that my husband had we had so many guys there mm -hmm. who were so terrific who wanted to get married when it was all illegal. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you had to leave there and go and do and uh, you know you said to your son you know we would see heterosexual couples who would be like killing each other mm -hmm. and here were these guys who were you know totally wanting and then when it you know finally did become legal why not you know let everybody have you love you love mm -hmm. and if marriage is the answer I don't know that that is either mm -hmm. but 
It is the commitment, and it's legal, and it's acceptable. But it's still, you know, when you hear about it, even though now gay marriage is legal, when you're in certain areas and you talk about it, you hear, you know, the people who are really very conservative, mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of Italian people, too. Yes. I mean, where I used to live in Queens, in Malba, Whitestone, there are certain things they do not accept oh. or believe in, unless it's their own child. Yep. Then, yeah. then <laughs> what do you do? Give this kid up. Exactly. Uh, and I don't think that happens, not among Italians. They, they still try and keep it all under the wire. Mm. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated world, and why not? Right. You know, and love is love. I don't exactly. care what, you know, which yeah. way it goes. And if you can't stop, you, you know, why, why stop it? What is the most important aspect of your work in theater? First of all, the, the greatest sin in theater is to be boring. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what I like to do in my plays is grab people from the first sentence and take them on a journey and let them go at the end. <laughs> and, and, uh, just really take them through something, but what you take people through is also important. But what we're really interested in is, is confronting the, the difficult situations of today, sometimes through a historical lens, but mainly through a contemporary lens, mm -hmm. and showing characters who come out the other end uh, in, in ways of healing, compassion, and uh, uh, action that works against the prevailing violence in the in the world. Mm -hmm. So we're interested in taking audiences on a journey to another place where they can see how people negotiate nonviolently in the world, which doesn't mean there's not violence in the plays, but it means that we don't we don't glorify that violence. We work against it and we mediate against it. We do have stories where that that show that reflect what's happening in contemporary society, but we also need to show what we could have. Right, and it's that that balance, that kind of um, vision of another way uh, that that has to do with people really communicating with each other. So that is what we try to show. So to use an example, the, the most recent play of mine that I've written is called Extreme Weather, W-H-E-T-H-E-R. Mm -hmm. And it is about, it's the story of climate change scientists and their attempt to tell the truth about climate change. Um, but when Jim Hansen, who's the prominent climate scientist in this country, who went to Congress in 1989 and said global warming has begun, and the play is uh, to some degree based on his life, when he saw the play, he had already read it, he had vetted the science, the science is all accurate. Then he came to see the play and he said, the most important thing about the play is, is its love of nature. Mm -hmm. And he said, this is a play that could really change people's minds. The, the documentaries are boring, but this play is not boring because it's about real people and it's about the love of, their love of nature. And he said, you can't fight to save the climate systems unless you also love nature. So that's the kind of work that we try to do. Um, we try to wake up those feelings in the audience. Truth honesty, as far as every moment being real and not, I mean, I think that's, I, I'm part of the actor's studio and I think that's basically what they, they go after in the moment mm -hmm. and, and when they're doing, you know, when they talk about the method, as mm -hmm. far as it has to connect somewhere inside of you. Maybe you don't have that personal experience. Maybe the character has been raped and you, thankfully you've never experienced that, mm -hmm. but there's something inside of you that has a connection to that, and what is that connection, and how can you use your real life experience to fill that, to create the many layers to it? Mm -hmm. So I'm always searching for that truth. What draws me in when I'm watching other people's work, when I find that I'm moved, it is, it is, um, are, are, like people who really, really care about things, even if those things are seemingly insignificant. Mm -hmm. um, but people who have really strong wants and desires, I'm really drawn to theater where things are a big deal for the people in the 
play. The, the stakes, the wants are real. And I think we can, whether we can relate to the specific want, we mm -hmm. can relate to um, the human experience of desire and needing things. Um, in my work, I really, uh, I don't exclusively write stories about the working classes, um, but that's an important part of my work, I think, of, of what I've written. It's class experience, especially for, um, it, I grew up around a lot of it's Italian Americans and uh, Irish Americans, um, like in a very blue collar community. And I just think like t telling that story is important to me on the stage. Mm -hmm. Of like, of let's say the proletariat or the working class. Yeah, and not exclusively, mm -hmm. but I think that even in things where I have uh, people who have um, moved into a different class, uh, who have like done well, I think their history in that or the way that um, classes collide in whatever the story it is that I'm telling is a feature in my work mm -hmm. in in many ways. Why is it important for you to tell that or for people to know this story, these stories? So often, I think plays because of the people who pick to produce them and finance them are often um, the story of the upper middle classes. Not always, but it's at least what I end up seeing most mostly produced on Broadway and even mm. off Broadway. And I just think that you know the majority of people um, in uh, America are not living that story and. Um, and I think it's important for people to see experiences that mirror their own on stage because uh, I think I, I at least feel like I've like learned to handle <laughs> problems in my life based on the way like characters I love mm -hmm. handle them, mm -hmm. or at least it helps me feel like I'm. It sort of sounds insane, but I've felt like if this character went through it, I don't feel as alone in mm -hmm. a similar it's circumstance. Cathartic. Right? Yeah. Theater is cathartic. Yeah. Not only for the audience, but for the actors mm -hmm. and for everyone who's working together to build that ensemble. When I did Her Name is Kathy, you know, it's still controver very controversial. Uh, and it's, do you believe in it or don't believe in it? Mm -hmm. Or do you, can you rectify it to yourself? or? And uh, I mean, you see, people are are rebelling. Mm -hmm. the, the people who were against it are still holding up. And I don't blame them, you know, if they're, but I have never had one. So on that aspect, I don't know. Mm -hmm. If I would need it, uh, or if anyone in my family would, you know, I'd go along with it. Mm -hmm. But I guess there would be something in me from when I was a kid. Uh, the where you know where they taught religion. If you commit a mortal sin, you will be burning for the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back to trying to write it. It was written as a series and picked up. Uh -huh. And this is um, Pleasant uh, Avenue. Yeah, 119 okay. Pleasant and Avenue. And did Pleasant Avenue come from her name is Kathy? 119 Pleasant Avenue was kind of written first as you know, almost like a piece of journalism more than anything else. But it, it all stems back to that time. And your, your grandmother, the hero. And, well, I didn't know she was a hero back then. I just, you know, I adored her, I loved her. She was a really very independent woman for that time. You mentioned rape and all, and things that are affecting women, and you were mentioning the working class and how this needs to be represented. I wanted to talk to you about A Bad Night, because okay. you're, now, you're now developing this project. Right. A Bad Night is a documentary play that I started um, with a classmate of mine, Amy E. Whitting, when we were getting our MFA at Hunter College under Tina Helm, Mark Bly, and Arthur Copet. And uh, so over the last two and a half years, um, Amy and I interviewed people about acquaintance rape, um, just their experience with it. Uh, there was a little bit of outreach. Um, some national organizations assisted us with that. So we took, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of pages of transcripts and um, made it into this documentary play that um, we're actually having a workshop at at Hunter College. And so hopefully from there, it'll be ready to be out into the world. Um, but that, yeah, I think that was, Emily, we were taking a documentary theater course, and Emily Mann, who is um, 
an amazing playwright and wonderful director as well. And she's at the McCarter Theater in Princeton, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, she does a lot of documentary work, so she was talking to us. And we had the option, instead of writing an academic paper, to do a, a make our own play. You know, I was just thinking acquaintance rape has just been something that, uh, you know, almost, I know the statistics are one in four women have been raped, but um, anecdotally, the statistics that I observe having talking to women is more like one out of two, at least from what my experience of it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we just wanted to get to the bottom of um, like what is going on? Like do people not know? And I think what we find in this play is that many times, not all the time, people do not know that they're raping somebody. So I think they just don't understand what consent is. So that's that's what we're hoping this play helps reveal. Wow, it's a very, very important, very important topic, mm -hmm. especially now. Yeah. You have an interesting story um, of when you were in Italy with the beekeeper's daughter, not only where you performed, the location, let's uh -huh. say, and but during the rehearsal process. Yeah, right. So this is a play that we're reviving. This is our first revival in 21 years. And it's the play that we formed the theater to do. So it's called The Beekeeper's Daughter. I wrote it during the Bosnian War, when the war was still going on. And it's the story of a woman who has been raped in one of the rape camps and is brought to an island in the Adriatic uh, where an ex a patriot American poet and his sister, a beekeeper, are living, and his lover, who's a young homosexual or bisexual, it turns out, androgynous, beautiful, sort of Dionysiac creature. So they're living in the paradise, and into paradise comes a raped woman, very pregnant, brought there by the poet's daughter, Rachel, who's a human rights activist, and she too has been through the war. So we have these two ravaged women who have been through the war enter this kind of late 20th century paradise. Um, the play was written in 1995. And while we were rehearsing the play in a village, we didn't speak much Italian, the villagers didn't speak much English, but they would come and watch the rehearsals. And there was a domestic violence problem in this village. And so all the women would come to the scenes and watch the scenes in which the women were healing each other and helping each other through their trauma. And the men would come and watch the scene where the father and the daughter fought, <laughs> and this bitter, bitter fight. Uh, and this was sort of every day. And then the, the woman who played the Bosnian uh, raped woman would walk through the town. She, her costume was a blue jean jumper and this pregnant belly. And so everybody called her Madonna. And they would call out to her, hey, Madonna, Madonna. <laughs> uh, so it's very, very moving. And the play was a big success at that festival. And then we brought it back here and, and uh, was also a big success in the very first production we did of it. So we're bringing it back now because we're in another refugee crisis, a worse refugee crisis. And refugees, I mean, this is a play about what happens when you open your heart and your life to a refugee woman. She's pregnant, she has the baby. Um, everybody's life is turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And at the end, they all come out um, stronger and deeper people. So that the play is really uh, a, a healing, drama. You have to go through the, the crisis, but emerge really as a more intact family and a, and a larger extended family. Eve, I want to find out more about your work as well, because the, I've, ha I've had the pleasure of being directed by you briefly, which was wonderful, but the only piece I've seen that you directed was uh, Solo Anna. Myself and playwright Franco Di Alessandro have worked together for, I don't want to say how many years <laughs> because that's going to date me, but probably now about 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and and a, f a, a funny Franco story about my process, this is probably about 20 years ago at Here Performance Space down on 6th mm -hmm. Avenue. And three different one acts by Franco, three different directors, and we're working on a piece um, about 9-11, right after the fact, called Before and After. And we were working on an exercise where each one of the actors, and I believe there were six in the play, were bringing in 
a sign, a missing sign of somebody they had lost. Oh. And Franco came in with the producer, and I'm so excited about what they've come up with. And, and he was like, he pulls me to the side, the producer pulls me to the side, and he says, where are my words? And I was like, wait, what do you mean? And he's like, where are the words of the play? They're, they're doing an exercise, and they have all these pictures and, and missing, and, and I don't understand. The play goes up in a week. Where are the words? And I was like, oh, we're not there yet. He's like, <laughs> what do you mean you're not there yet? Like, you have to rehearse the words. I was like, I love what they're doing. Aren't you very excited? This is great work. And he's like, but it's not my work. I was like, of course this is your work. We have to get there. You have to, we have to build where these people came from. They haven't earned your words yet. Mm -hmm. Your words are going to be so easy. They're going to fall right off of the tongue. But first, we have to establish where these people have come from and what they've been through. It's not enough that you're dealing with New York actors. They have to decide who it is that they lost. Because once they can personalize it for themselves, mm -hmm. all of your words are going to scream. So they threatened to take the play away and, and hire another director. And I was, like, f furious. And then the cast was like, no, no, we want Eva. I was like, thank you, thank you. And the play went up, and everybody, not to do one of these, but everybody was like, Franco, this play, oh, my <laughs> God, it, it ripped my heart out. And, and he kind of looked over at me and gave me a nod, and then we've been working together for 20 years. <laughs> now, granted... You would think that after that experience that he wouldn't come after me, like, what are you doing? But, you know, cut to maybe 15 years later when we started working on Ana Magnani, mm -hmm. the solo show, and we didn't pick up his words right away. Sure enough, I heard, well, did you start working on that monologue that I wrote about the, the, the leopard that she <laughs> receives from Rosalini? And I was like, no, of <laughs> course not. We're not there yet. I can't use the words yet. And he's, he's like, oh, I can't. I can't even be in rehearsal with you. It's too much. It's too aggravating. I, I get nervous. And so I'm a big believer in creating everything, all of the backstory and all of the history and, you know, whatever the actors come up with is, that's it. Now that's, we're cementing a foundation and we have to build from there. Mm -hmm. But we, even if it's, even if it's real life, you know, we're building on a history, on a is a real life or was a real life person and you still have to understand each one of those moments her relationship to animals her relationship to her son who had polio her relationship to so many men even the cats in Rome like everything had to be built from the ground up and that's kind of how I work but for playwrights it, it's it's a bit it's it's a lot it's a lot <laughs> <laughs> and I get that if the theater could change, magically change one thing, what would you, what uh, would you choose that to be? Well, it would be nice if, uh, you know, like Broadway now has become almost, you know, even though there are a lot of good shows, mm -hmm. it's over $100 to go. And there are a lot of people who would love to go. The people who need it the most. Yeah, and can't afford right. it. That, that's what I would change. Or, you know, maybe get the very wealthy, very, very wealthy to contribute to a, a certain portion of a play, mm -hmm. you know, and that's for these people to come in and feel like they're part of, uh, you know, I see it at HB mm -hmm. where you have a lot of senior citizens who are there with, and they're coming and thank you God they don't have to pay uh -huh. a dime to see a production. How often are there productions at HP? Uh, you know, all different things. A lot of the student productions and then, you know, the regular ones. I'd say there are like four plays. And we do a lot of reading as well, which for a lot of the elderly, they feel like they're part of, uh, you know, like the, the inner part. circle yeah. type oh, of thing. It's, it's really, uh, you really feel blessed. Theater can can inspire people to uh, feel more deeply. And if people feel more deeply, then they can act from a higher part of themselves. Um, we, you know, we think and we often say theater opens people's hearts and minds. Uh, and once that happens, they're free in a way to, to, uh, you know, to just move in a different way, to see things in a different way, because so much of our culture reinforces the violence. And 
we don't want to do that. We want to reinforce another, another reality, which is that people are, can be amazingly kind, generous, and uh, brave. <laughs> it does this anyway, but I, maybe if it had a, a greater impact on youth. Hmm. Because the both of us spoke about how at, at such a young age it had affected us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the same case for you. Absolutely. But I want the to way be <laughs> <laughs> the way the way it's magical. It, it's yeah. not it's not like film, it's not like music, mm -hmm. it's not like dance. Mm -hmm. There there's a visceral feeling that happens when you experience mm -hmm. theater and the way Shakespeare used to be enjoyed, the way mm -hmm. Chekhov used to be enjoyed when they talk about how they used to throw tomatoes because they were so engulfed in the experience that mm -hmm. they felt that it was happening right. and that they had to react, mm -hmm. that there was no fourth wall, that mm -hmm. they were part of it, mm -hmm. that I would want theater to return to that, that mm -hmm. it was no longer this kind of theater where you sat in your seat and it was comfortable. Theater in the 70s that was that way, the living theater and the open theater, that's the kind of yeah. work that's always excited me, mm -hmm. where you were a part of it. There was no sitting back in your seat. You were actively involved mm -hmm. or, you know, or the group theater going on to, you know, going into Denny's with a Monopoly board with ketchup all over going, did you order this war? Mm -hmm. Like you never knew where it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So theater having an impact everywhere mm -hmm. where, you know, you were being surrounded by it, where it was affecting the culture and the way, the way children saw the world. Mm -hmm. Because now there is no understanding. There's all of this, this. Mm -hmm. and there's no interaction. Mm -hmm. So people don't even know how to talk to each other. And mm -hmm. when I see little kids that, that can't look up from a screen or an iPad or, you know, they, I'm, I'm talking to you, but you're right next to me, but I'm talking to you like this. Mm -hmm. So theater is a way to open up and to open out and to have an experience as a collective. Mm -hmm. If we could do that again with inviting children into theater, I think we would change our culture. Mm -hmm. We would have a culture yeah. because I feel like as... Americans, our culture, like we're bleeding out our, like we don't even have a culture anymore. Mm -hmm. It's, where did it go? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> where is it? Yeah, I mean, what do you think culture. about it? <laughs> right? When you think about it that way, it's like the, th the experience of theater is almost radical in this sort of digital mm -hmm. world that we exist in today. Mm -hmm. um, and there really is something, there is something about like the energy transference that takes place in a room where people are making art and people are watching art and it's really happening and, uh, it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. In a, in a way that is, yeah, it is just, it's un unique to this medium. What words of wisdom would you impart to young women, Italian American uh. women <laughs> in the arts or in the theater? Don't give up. <laughs> I've given up many times. And when you give up, you know the end of the story. Uh, and if you don't give up, you don't know the end of the story. So I would say don't give up. And, and I would also say, Keep your love of what you do, which means, of course, renewing it, going back to the source that feeds you and dipping in again. So in my case, often it's Greek drama <laughs> going back. And I, because I can teach, I can teach these plays over and over. And, and that's a great privilege for me because I have to reread them. And even, you know, uh, so don't give up and keep uh, drinking from that source that, that feeds you. And uh, something that I try to do more, that I should do more, is try to be generous with others. Don't, uh, there's so much negativity. Be kind and be generous. And, and you know, know that, that really the only thing that has ever changed the world is literature and art. That if we don't put the new vision out, it won't be there. I think this is advice for every age and every gender. <laughs> And, every and for field. Italian Americans, cook, eat, <laughs> be merry. That will create be peace. <laughs> I would say create your own. Mm -hmm. That that's really the key to anything in life. That there's no reason to wait. This is the hardest. I'm going to say probably the hardest profession because mm -hmm. you could win an Academy Award and still never work again. Mm -hmm. And I don't know any other industry that you can reach the top and then still not have job security. Especially as a woman. Especially right. oh, as gosh. a woman. Yeah. Even though there are more roles now and there, there's more w women filmmakers, mm -hmm. but it's still, you know, a shocker. Right. <laughs> you know, if a female director wins or, you know, it, we're still not represented like we can be as far as like the amount of cinematographers. It's just, 
Right. But if you're creating your own, then you're not waiting and you're developing the projects that you have passion for mm -hmm. and that's really what we need more of. Mm -hmm. And the only way to change these problems is for more of us to keep like marching forward mm -hmm. um, and hopefully uh, be in positions of power at some point to start assigning jobs to other women. So that's a, yeah. I think that's a re real. Real women think we empower have, each other. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's no competition, there's no competitiveness. That real women give each other an opportunity and it's not, it's not about culture, it's about, you know, what you have a voice let's hear it right i've always been very big on that yeah. for women by women about women yeah do it do whatever you want and know that you deserve it because what happens with a lot of italian even today uh you find that even though they're mm, 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 when you get down to the the gut it's Oh, I don't know, you know, if I can. How is it watching your daughter and her success? Wonderful. And she, you know, was not, as a kid, I'm going to be an actress, actress, actress. Mm -hmm. She was in school, and she uh, went to NYU. Then uh, from there, she wasn't, I don't know, yeah, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. She saw me become an actress, and she started taking, you know, other more you know, selective things here and there. And she started getting parts, which, you know, you can't, I mean, that's like the magic of it all. Yeah. When she got that soprano part and other yeah. TV parts here and there. And as much as she loved theater, she loves TV because you can have your life. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At the same time, she's got now two kids, uh -huh. get paid. Uh, she comes in the end of May to do the new series, Shades of Blue, uh -huh. with uh, Jennifer Lopez and uh -huh. Ray Liotta. Uh -huh. Just do, do, do what you really want to do. I'm not saying avoid your children, avo if you have children, or, but for yourself to build up so you're not, you, you know that you have done what you can do for you. And if you do what you can do for you, you will overwhelmingly do what you can do for everybody else. Forthcoming productions of their works are Nicole Pandolfo's play, part of 48 Hour Musicals, April 15th through the 17th at Colab Arts in New Brunswick, New Jersey. More info at NicolePandolfo.com. Karen Malpeeds, The Beekeeper's Daughter, June 2nd through the 27th at Theatre for the New City. Info at Theatre3Collaborative.org. Ava Minimar's The Mommy Show, June 3rd at QED Astoria. Find out more at AvaMinimar.com. And Donna DeMatteo's Playwriting Class at HBStudio.org. Happy Women's History Month from Italics. Tune in to our next regular program, premiering April 27th. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.